recording. So welcome everybody. So this is already 65th Flow Talk, where Flow stands for Operator Learning One Word Seminar. And it was created to provide a global online forum for the dissemination of the latest scientific research results in all aspects of operator learning including distributed optimization, learning algorithms, privacy, cryptography, personalization, communication compression, systems, hardware, and many more. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce you uh, our speaker, Peter Richtarik, who is also together with me, Samuel Horvath, uh, then Virginia Smith, Aurelian Bellat, and Dan Alistar, one of the organizers of Flow Seminar. So Peter is a professor of computer science at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. His research focus is mostly in the intersection of mathematics, computer science, machine learning, optimization, numerical linear algebra, and high-performance computing. And he's one of the original developers of ferret learning. And today he's gonna tell us more about permutation compressors for probably faster distributed non-convex optimization. Thank you, Peter. Well, it's yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks everybody for showing up to, uh, uh, to this uh, flow talk today. I will talk about uh, uh, recent research which uh, appeared on archive late uh, last year and was recently accepted to iClear. And uh, this is on a new type of compressors uh, for communication efficient distributed training and especially relevant to fairy learning, but not, uh, not uh, exclusively. And we call them permutation compressors. And uh, these permutation compressors fall in a larger class of so-called input variance compressors, which I'll describe later on, which have some nice theoretical properties. And then you could see these theoretical properties also uh, showing up in practice. Uh, this is John work with uh, two great colleagues with uh, Rafael Slendak, who is in the audience, I believe, today, and, uh, and Alexander Turin. So Rafael was an intern uh, in, in the team here at KAUST, and Alexander is, is a postdoc. Uh, I will first introduce the problem very briefly. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it because uh, most of you are familiar with the basic the, the description of distributed training and, and, and uh, uh, the communication bottleneck. Then I will uh, give a brief introduction of compression operators, which uh, uh, is really leading us to this third point. Uh, so these bold uh, points three to six, uh, this is where the novel juice of this talk is. So I'll talk about joint design of compression operators rather than the typical individual independent design. And then I'll talk about some other aspects of this uh, analysis, uh, the notion of Hessian variance. Then I'll produce uh, some slides uh, related to the theoretical analysis. And, and, and finally, I conclude with some experiments. Uh, to introduce the problem, we want to minimize the average of uh, n functions. In this case, n is the number of clients we're working in. Uh, cross silo ferry learning. So N could be very large, uh, but what, what might be even larger is D, the number of parameters, uh, because typically modern uh, models are overparameterized. So D would be larger than the number of uh, devices that you have. So this will be the main bottleneck uh, uh, of, of the problem, just size D of the model. But still, n can be huge, and each uh, function fi can be, let's say, empirical risk uh, of, again, millions or thousands or tens of uh, examples stored on that client, depending on how, how much data is stored on that uh, client. We are not going to make any assumptions on the similarity or dissimilarity of the distributions, uh, where the, uh, which lead to these local data sets. Uh, so this, uh, uh, all the theoretical results uh, apply to arbitrarily heterogeneous data. Uh, so as you all know, in uh, distributed training in general and fairly learning in particular, communication is really complicated. It, it is the bottleneck or one of the bottlenecks of, of any efficient system. Here is a simple example of just three machines 
which as you can see are heterogeneous, connected through some sort of a connection, typically could be the internet, to some orchestrating server. Each of them has some local training data set, D1, D2, D3. These local training data sets give rise to local loss functions, F1, F2, F3. And what we want to do is minimize the average over these uh, loss functions. So we're finding one model, uh, which minimizes the empirical risk across all the data stored across all the devices. Uh, in order to reveal right away uh, uh, the assumptions we're going to make on the theoretical analysis, I want to say we only have two assumptions and they're very weak. So the first assumption is that the gradient is differentiable and not only that, but, uh, but it's uh, continuous uh, and in particular Lipschitz continuous. Uh, of all of these individual functions. So this is uh, a weak assumption. And second one is that the average of these loss functions is lower bounded, which is again, weak assumption. If you want to minimize F, uh, it, it makes sense to assume F is lower bounded. Otherwise the minimum will not exist or it'll be minus infinity, depending how you think of it. So this is in some sense uh, uh, a necessary assumption. So this is all we're going to really assume about these functions. So we're operating in a very general uh, setup. We're not assuming any kind of convexity, no strong convexity, no convexity, uh, nothing like this. So this is fully non-convex. Our goal will be to find a possibly random model X. And this is what the expectation really refers to, to the randomness of the model, uh, who's, uh, that leads to a loss function whose gradient is going to be small. So we were looking for essentially an approximately stationary point in expectation. And the expectation is because of the randomness of the model and randomness of the model is because the algorithm for finding the model could be random. So, so the expectation has nothing to do with the randomness in the data. So this would be our goal. So notice we're not really interested in finding the global minimum. This is not something which in general in the setting we're interested in, we can guarantee, but we're looking really for a, an approximately stationary point. And what is very important, we want to do this with minimal communication. And this is because we're assuming that communication is really the bottleneck in, in any distributed system we're considering. Uh, and by this, we mean the number of bits that are transfer, transferred from the clients to the server. That's what we want to really minimize. So, so we want to minimize the number of bits transferred from the clients to the server. Uh, a subject to the constraint that we satisfy this inequality, essentially. We want to solve the problem, but with minimal number of uh, communicated bits. So there are many uh, tricks which are being used to, uh, to, to um, make uh, federal learning algorithms better in one or another sense of the word. word. So for instance, par partial participation is necessary in a cross-device setting because you just uh, can't assume every device, every client is going to be available in every communication round. Some, some people just uh, may be using these phones. Uh, stochastic approximation is often used where one works with uh, stochastic gradients rather than full gradients. One may be taking multiple local steps. One may be adding some noise in order to uh, guarantee differential privacy, but we're not going to uh, worry about any of these. We're going to look at the pure problem of uh, communication compression and how can we in some sense uh, do uh, it in a better way than, than the state of the art uh, way uh, known up to date. Now, this doesn't mean that our techniques are not combinable with these. Uh, we're just saying we are not talking about them and, and, and we leave this for future research. Um, in order to uh, explain uh, the idea of permutation compressors, we, we had to choose some algorithm we would apply these compressors to. So this is a generic idea, which can be applied essentially to almost any algorithm that uses communication compression. But we chose uh, the Marina algorithm of Gorbunov and Carters from last year's ICML, because this achieves the state-of-the-art communication complexity in the setting we're considering. So in the smooth, non-convex setting. So, uh, so the question, the hypothesis we have here, can we improve with this idea, the state of the art communication complexity and in what regime can we do that across all regimes or, or what's really going on? So Marina is a, an algorithm which is seemingly simple. So it takes current model XT, subtracts some multiple of some gradient estimator GT, 
uh, to produce a new model of G XT plus one. And GT is just average of some local gradient estimators. So the difficulty in Marina really comes from the definition of these GITs. So this is the definition of GIT in Marina. So Marina uh, uh, works in the following way, that with probability P, client I sends to the master the full gradient of the local loss function at xt plus one. And with probability one minus P, uh, sends only compressed uh, message. And probability P will be typically very, very small. So, so very rarely this full gradient will be sent. And this full gradient is d-dimensional, so this will involve a lot of co communication. But with very, very high probability, which means most of the time, uh, massively most of the time, uh, one will only send this compressed difference between uh, compressed difference of the last two uh, local gradients. So this GT vector will not be sent to the master because the master already knows this from previous iterations. So just believe me that this GT can be computed by the master. So we don't have to send this. We only send this compressed difference. And then the master averages this compressed information, adds this to GT, and this is how GT plus one will be uh, produced. So this is how the algorithm looks like. And the compression of differences uh, really comes from the idea of reducing the variance that comes from compression. So Marina uh, is a non-convex method which uses compression, but also reduces the variance that comes from compression. Now, in this talk, we're going to be interested in a very specific class of compressors. So these are unbiased randomized compressors. So this is the unbiasedness property. Uh, and we're assuming that the variance is upper bounded by a constant multiple of the square norm of the input vector. So this is a classical definition of unbiased uh, compression operators, and it includes uh, tens or even hundreds of specific compressors such as quantization operators and, and sparsification operators and, and combinations uh, thereof. Uh, so let me give you some examples of this, but before, before that I want to, uh, I want to highlight that uh, what uh, we really want to do in algorithms that use compressed communication is that we want to really uh, approximate the average of some possibly dense and high dimensional vectors VI by the average of compressed variance of these vectors. So that's what we really want to do. So in order to do, good, do a good job at this, we would want to construct these compressors so that in some sense, the variance of this average of compressed vectors is as small as possible. And then we hope that maybe if we do, do this right, the algorithm will accelerate. So that's what's behind. The classical approach to, to, to this is uh, to design these compressors CI that operate on these individual clients independently. So that's the classical approach. And uh, I'm going to explain it next. So the current literature is really almost entirely focusing on this, at least the current literature, which also analyzes uh, iterative algorithms and doesn't uh, merely uh, uh, focus on distributed mean estimation. Uh, so you would design this compressor CI independently, independently of all the other devices. Now, what we propose in this paper we want to design these compressors jointly uh, across all these devices, but, but in a way that is communication efficient and that leads to improvement in the theoretical and, and practical communication complexity. Uh, so let's uh, do a very, very brief uh, outline of how the first, the, 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 the prevalent approach uh, really looks like. Uh, so the two big classes of compression operators that belong uh, to this class of unbiased compressors are sparsification and quantization operators. So the idea of sparsification is that you do you reduce the number of entries from D in this com in this vector that you want to communicate to some small number capital K. And if K is let's say one, then the compression ratio would be D to one. So you're saving a factor of D in communications, and D could be millions or even larger. And then this is really, really huge uh, savings in terms of uh, communication time. Of course, this has effect on the convergence speed of the algorithm and uh, the uh, effect would be adverse. And the question is, uh, what's really the combined effect? Quantization works in a very different way. It doesn't try to reduce the number of entries. It keeps all of these entries intact. So all of these D entries will be communicated, but uh, 
Uh, instead, the strategy is to reduce the number of bits uh, representing each entry. So instead of using, let's say, 32 or 64 bits, you would use only B bits, and B could be, let's say, 3 or 6 or 9 or something like this, and then the compression ratio would be 32 to B. And typically, one might even want to combine these approaches and sparsify, and for the non-sparsified elements, use quantization, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's look at sparsification, because uh, this is... Uh, this will lead to the uh, underlying idea behind this paper, the permutation compressor has something to do with sparsification. So let me give you a simple example. So here we're going to sparsify five-dimensional vectors. So we're operating in, in, in five-dimensional space, these five. And we use the rand k compressor with k is equal to one, which means we only keep one random entry of the input vector. In this case, the random entry is the third entry. We flip the coin where each of these entries uh, could be chosen with probably one over five. We zero out everything else, and then we multiply this vector by five uh, because we want this to be an unbiased estimator of this vector on the left. So if you multiply by the dimension, that's what you're going to get. So this uh, uh, compression mechanism uh, belongs to this category in the upper right. Uh, so this is an unbiased uh, compressor. And it, it has variants which, uh, which satisfy this inequality. And in particular, omega i just happens to be exactly d minus 1 in this case. In general, it's d over k minus 1. So if you compress a lot, and in this case, we really squeeze out the maximum juice out of sparsification, because if we zero out d minus 1 entries and kept only 1, then omega i is going to be huge, so d minus 1. So the variance will grow. And in general, the larger the variance, the more you can compress. Uh, if you flip the coin uh, again, then this uh, compressor might output a different vector because it's a randomized compressor. So in this case, uh, everything was zero out except for the last entry. Again, this gets multiplied by five, and this would be the output. If you flip the coin again, maybe the first entry would be kept and all the other entries would be sparsified, would be, would be set to zero. So this is how random K works. Now, let's introduce this idea, at least intuitively first, of joint design of compression operators. So the starting point of this is uh, a certain weakness that we noticed of this independent approach to designing compressors, and that is that they perform very badly or badly when uh, similar vectors are aggregated. So let me explain what I mean by this. So let's say that we have just three clients and they want to aggregate uh, uh, three-dimensional vectors. This is a very, very simple example, of course. In practice, n would be big and d would be big, but I want to actually show a numerical example here. Uh, so these vectors are completely identical. Let's see what would happen if they're completely identical and we use the random one sparsifier. So this is what happens when everybody sparsifies uh, their vectors. So let me go back. So I hit this again. So the first client just flipped this coin and with probably 130 chose the first entry to keep. The second client chose the second entry to keep and the last client also chose the second entry to keep. So this is a random choice. Uh, if you flip these coins again, then maybe some different entries will be highlighted. But what I want to really stress here is this possibility that two clients will really choose the same entry. So if we do this, then let's see at the quality of the average of these compressed vectors. So you look at the average of these compressed vectors and you get the vector four minus 14, zero, which is not the average of the original vectors, which is four minus seven, two, which is what all the VS were to begin with. So this, this comes really from the randomness uh, in, embedded um, in these uh, compressors. But of course, uh, we actually could do better by being smarter. And being smarter means uh, coordinating. So what we can do instead is we can design these sparsifiers jointly. So we're not going to change the fact that each client is using random one compressor. We'll still use random one compressor. But what we're going to do is we're going to uh, agree among these clients uh, on the correlation between these random one compressors. So in particular, we're going to require that everybody chooses a different uh, element. So the first client chooses the first element of the vector, the second chooses the third, and the last one chooses the second. So now this is just a random permutation of these elements. So one, two, one, three, two. So the idea is to 
choose a random permutation of these elements. And then the first client would choose uh, the first element in that permutation, which happens to be one. Second client chooses the second element in the permutation, which, would ha which happens to be three. And the last client chooses the last one. So by doing this, and of course, assuming that all of these vectors that we wanted to aggregate were identical in the first place, we achieve uh, what uh, uh, we would hope ideally to achieve, that this complex communication actually leads to exactly zero variance. We have recovered the average of those VIs precisely without any error whatsoever. So this very simple idea uh, leads to the definition of so-called permutation compressors, but uh, I wish to now uh, go from this intuition to formalism, and suddenly there'll be a little bit of jump in this uh, talk because I will, for, for a moment, I'm going to just forget about this idea of permutation compressors and just show you the inequality that, uh, that actually captures uh, what intuitively we're capturing in this permutation compressor example. So, so it, we propose a new inequality uh, for the joint design of compressors. And this is doing new inequality. These are the vectors that we want to uh, average. Uh, N is the number of clients, CIs are the compressors, and uh, A and B are some parameters which will define uh, the quality of this collection of compressors. So what you see here on the left-hand side is nothing else than the variance of this average of compressed, uh, compressed uh, messages as an estimator of the average of the uncompressed messages. So this is what we want to be as small as possible, because if that is zero, then that means that even with complex communication, we're able to perfectly recover the true average. And now on the right-hand side, we have something strange. So we have uh, a multiple of the average of the squared norms of those input vectors minus a multiple of the squared norm of the average of the input vectors. So this is, uh, to the best of our knowledge, first time that an inequality of this type appears in literature on compressed communication. And, and, uh, and we suggest that this is the key to, to the improvement of the theoretical and practical behavior of MARINA, which is the state-of-the-art algorithm for non-convex smooth distributed communication efficient training. I will pause here uh, because I've covered a lot and I would welcome any, any questions. This is a reminder, please, if you have a question, oh, yeah. have to raise hands, but we unmute. Uh, I can see Anupam. somebody raising, raising hand. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Anupam. Uh, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, so um, uh, on the example you were showing uh, in the, in, where there were three uh, uh, nodes and the vector was also dimension three, what happens yeah. if the dimension is much, much higher, say a million, and you have a very small number of devices. Uh, will that example translate to that case? So then we need a generalization of the simple permutation compressor. And we have a definition of what we mean by a permutation compressor if D is bigger than N and when N is bigger than D. But uh, for the to get the intuition of what's going on, I think it's best to think about N being equal to D and you're not going to lose much. So. Uh, so when D is much bigger than N, then you could partition the D into, into N, let's say, uh, blocks and, and work that way. So that is roughly what's going on. But I think you're not losing much uh, in, the, in the intuition, just thinking N is equal to D. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I will welcome one or two more questions. Just take your time. I have, I'm quite happy to wait a little bit just to create some pause and plan for reflection. So I talk about the Zabian inequality, 
before I give this example of permutation compressor. And before this, this was just all some kind of an introduction. So, so the first technical concept really is this Fabian equality here. So while you're thinking about your questions, uh, so the standard approach to designing these compressors, as I said, is individual, so not this joint design. So, so you would just work with this general definition in this upper right corner of uh, compressor CI, which is unbiased, and its own individual variance is bounded by this omega i times the square norm of the input vector. So this definition is perfectly fine, except it completely fails to capture any kind of joint uh, power of the average of the CIs as an estimator of the average of the of the of the uncompressed vectors. So that's what's really missing. And, and remember that is actually what we want to do. So, so I started here with this estimation here. So what we really want to do, we want to estimate some average of some dense vectors by the average of compressed vectors. And if we design these compressors individually, certainly we're losing something. And the proposal here is if these VIs are similar, maybe we can do much better using this permutation idea. And there's some other ideas later on that, uh, that, that um, actually um, can be captured by a framework, some other concrete compressors uh, and, and to reduce this variance and reduction, reduction of this variance will lead hopefully to better uh, theoretical convergence and practical behavior. So this is really the basic underlying idea. Let's design these compressors jointly. And AB inequality is the inequality, which it turns out for this algorithm, Marina dictates uh, the quality of this joint design. So what, what we ideally want is this constant A to be as small as possible and constant B to be as large as possible so that the variance uh, is as uh, small as possible. But both of these constants will show up in our analysis and, and, and we'll see um, how and, and what, uh, uh, what we achieve. So the basic insight beyond this would be that if you des design these compressors not jointly, but individually, you don't benefit from this minus term that just doesn't appear there and this B is zero. So you can never benefit from this. But uh, when you introduce smart correlation between these compressors and permutation compressor is one type of smart correlation, then you benefit from this minus B and this benefit can actually be huge. That's really what's going on here. Okay, so that's 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 why this B part is important. Okay. So there is a question yeah. from Constantine. Please go ahead, Constantine. Thank you. Is it something I should read? Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I have two questions. Uh, so expectation uh, is taken with respect to randomness. Uh, from sampled permutation, if it is so, how permutation is sampled? So permutations so here, are informal at random. So here the expectation with respect to these compressor CI, we assume that these CIs are randomized mappings from RD to RD, and expectation is with respect to that randomization. So I'm not assuming that these are permutation compressors yet. I'm assuming these are any mappings from RD to RD that satisfy this uh, uh, this inequality. In fact, I'm also assuming they're unbiased, but I didn't tell you that. Uh, so I'm not assuming these are uh, permutations, but if these would be co permutation compressors, then yes, we choose uh, every permutation with equal probability. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and second question was regarding AB. So I can select AB, for example, A0 and B equal to 10, but I will break the fundamental rules of calculus Yes, you cannot uh, you cannot choose A, B, 0, and B, 10, because then left-hand side is not negative and right-hand side would be non-positive, and this wouldn't be possible unless average of E is 0. So we cannot choose A and B. So what we, what we do, we choose these compressors, and then we need to prove this inequality, and the A and B would be just a property of this choice of compressors. Okay, so we want to design these compressors so that A is as small as possible and B is as large as possible but we cannot just choose A and B to be anything because this inequality has to hold for every uh, VI. So all these mm -hmm. vectors VIs in RD. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Any more questions? There are no questions in the chat. Okay, so then I'll continue. So let's 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 look at this inequality and and try to try to infer a few uh, few basic uh, facts from this. So the first inference here is if the A B inequality holds, and of course we need to prove this for concrete set of compressors, we would need to prove it. Uh, then it turns out that this inequality holds, and here C is just the average of C i's. So uh, CIs are just mappings. Average of CI is a valid mapping. Okay, so if you think of this average of CIs as a compressor, which is of course a little bit strange uh, concept, but you can think of it as a compressor because it's randomized, map, randomized mapping from RD to RD, then it would satisfy the standard uh, standard assumption of an unbiased mapping. If CIs are unbiased with bounded variance, where the variance bound is A minus B. Okay. So this is this gives us some kind of intuition why we want A to be as small as possible and B to be as large as possible because we can by by choose by 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 designing the compressors that way we can reduce the variance of this C mapping which is the average of the CIs. Now, immediate consequence of this is that A cannot possibly be smaller than B because if this is true and A was smaller than B then this inequality cannot possibly be true. So. A has to be at least equal to B. So the best we can hope for in this AB inequality is A equal to B. That's the best we could possibly hope for. So if we already minimize A, then the best we can hope for is B matches A, B can never be larger than A, okay? So, so this kind of intuitively means that A being equal to B is a very, very special setting, right? What would happen if A was equal to B? If we could design a, a sequence of compressors or a collection of compressors such that A would be equal to B, then this inequality, this from observation one, would mean that if we compress, if we, if we try to estimate the average of some vectors that are identical, okay, remember these VIs are identical, through these compressors, we get exactly zero variance. And that's precisely what the permutation compressor gave us as an example. That's, that was the N is equal to D is equal to three example just fits this framework where A is equal to B. In fact, it happens to be one in this case. And we get, we get exactly zero variance when trying to estimate the average of identical vectors. But of course, when we run the algorithm, uh, we're not going to be average, averaging identical vectors. These vectors would be, would be different. But still, uh, this is really uh, the formalism behind uh, the example with the permutation compressor. OK. So, uh, so because of this, we propose this notion of an input variance compressor. So we, we say that these uh, compressors C1 through Cn are input variance compressors. And again, notice that we're not talking about input variance compressors that are individually input variance compressors. As a collection, they have this property, which we call their input variance compressors. If uh, the A, B inequality holds with A being equal to B. So in this case, since A is equal to B, let's call that constant C. Okay, so A is equal to B, let's just call it C. So if you look here at the bottom left, at the AB inequality, how it looked like, then, and, and assume that A is equal to B, then the difference between these two guys is nothing else than this thing that I'm, that I'm circling around with my pointer. So this is just the variance of these vectors VI, if you think of vector VI as a random vector chosen uh, uniformly at random. So that's why we call them input variance compressors because you can think of this right hand side after the constant C as the variance of these vectors stored on these devices, on these clients, which you want to average ideally. So if you want to average uh, vectors that have huge variance, then also the variance of our estimation through compression will be possibly huge. But if they happen to have small variance, then the variance of this average of compressed vectors as an estimate of the average of the uncompressed vectors would also be small. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what input variance compressors are and the permutation compressor is one example of this. And uh, the variance uh, was zero in the example that we gave because the variance of the input vectors just happened to be zero because they were identical. So that's why this was the case. And C in that case just happens to be one. Okay, so uh, so there are 
uh, there are many examples of these uh, uh, types of compressors which satisfy the AB inequality. So for example, if you just pick uh, unbiased compressor CI with variance bounded by omega i times uh, norm of the input vector squared, and you don't assume any kind of independence between them, then you can prove that AB inequality holds with B being equal to zero and A is the maximum of the omega i's. As soon as you assume independence on top of it, then A shrinks by a factor of N and B is unchanged. So notice that the standard choice of compressors where there's either possibly bad dependence or independence, in both cases, you cannot benefit from constant B. But as soon as you introduce smart dependence, and that's what this permutation compressor gives us, and we have these two definitions. So, uh, so, so this is uh, pointing, this is answering Anupam's uh, question. If D is bigger than N, we have one definition. If D is smaller than N, we have another definition. But if D is equal to N, the definition is exactly what I gave you in this three-dimensional example. So in both cases, A just happens to be equal to B exactly. Uh, and that means that both of these lead to input variance uh, compressors. And we have some other examples in the paper, but uh, I'm not going to mention them here. Okay, so now it turns out if you want to analyze uh, a Marina algorithm and hope for an improvement with these input variance compressors or AB compressors uh, in, in, in general, we need to introduce a new smoothness notion. Uh, it is not going to be introducing new assumption. We're not introducing any more assumptions than assumption one and two, but it's a new notion which is somehow hidden, uh, which we need to kind of uncover and define in order to take advantage of. So let me do this step by step. So I will first introduce uh, some standard smoothness parameters, uh, which uh, you will be familiar with. So the first smoothness parameter is, this is the assumption one that we had there. Uh, so the gradient of each uh, function fi is uh, Lipschitz with constant li, okay? But think of this uh, through the uh, interpretation of le left-hand side. So we just have bound on gradient differences. Now, we can also have a bound on the second moment of gradient differences. So this is the second moment. If you think of this gradient difference as a random vector where i is chosen uniformly at random with probably one over n from all of these n uh, clients. So it's the same kind of a bound, which is called the constant uh, by a different name because uh, obviously the constant would be different. So then we can also introduce bound on the mean of gradient differences. If you do that, this is just standard definition of the Lipschitz continuity of the grade, gradient of F because average of the gradients of the local grains is just gradient of the average. So this is just gradient of F, okay? So we have these three quite standard uh, notions of smoothness. So the first and the third are completely standard. F being uh, L smooth and Fi being Li smooth. This is a little bit exotic, but in some papers you can find this This is, is something called average smoothness, but uh, I want to think of this as bound on gradient differences second moment of grain differences and mean of gradient differences. It turns out that in order to take advantage of these correlated compressors, these uh, compressors satisfying AB inequality, you need a different notion of smoothness. And that is, um, okay, so I have one more slide. <laughs> and that is, uh, we need to introduce a bound on the variance of gradient differences. But before I do that, I show you some relationship between these three notions. So it turns out that one implies two, one implies three and two implies uh, three. This is because of these inequalities. So if you have uh, Li smooth functions, then this uh, average of Li squares is going to be upper bound on L plus squared, which means that L plus is well-defined and finite. So one actually implies two and so on and so forth. We call these constants L minus and L plus precisely because of this inequality, L minus is always less than or equal to L plus. So L minus, remember this just standard smoothness constant of the gradient of F which is typically denoted just by L. But since we have four smoothness constants in this, in this paper, we chose to redefine them in some kind of intrinsically coherent way. So L minus L plus Li, and uh, the new one would be L plus minus. Uh, and not to confuse anybody, but uh, it uh, has a natural interpretation and the plus and minus uh, are justified there. So now think of the left-hand side as the variance of gradient differences because this is second moment, this is mean squared. Okay, so, so, the, so the difference is variance of gradient differences and we upper bounding it exactly the same way as before, except we need to rename the constant and now we call it L plus minus. Now, obviously 
uh, you can think of this as variance of something of this the random vector v where v is equal to vi with probability one over n and vi is just this gradient difference okay so let's try to tie this together with these other assumptions so we have a fourth assumption here and it turns out that two implies four uh, which means that uh, l plus minus is always upper bounded by l plus okay so we only assumed one and then lower boundedness of f but because we assumed one which is li smoothness of individual fi one implies two two implies four so four is not an additional assumption it doesn't restrict our class of functions in any way the l plus minus just is around whether we are aware of it or not and uh, typically uh, we're not taking advantage of it but in this work we will take advantage of it and we'll be able to take larger step sizes because of it and because of that we get improvement in the rate so that's how the uh, chain of uh, logic really works here Okay, so maybe I'll stop here again and welcome any questions. So I would want at least one question and that will allow me to continue. It's about me ask then this L plus minus as I'm, uh, yeah, so, so, so the bound on the variance gradient differences. Uh, if we take that as an assumption and analyze any other method with uh, independent compressions. Does it also lead to some improvement in the analysis when we use this uh, as an assumption rather than <clears throat> rather than this allies? Not that I know of. So somehow, because when you have these independent compressors, the parameter B in this A, B, and equal will be zero. And for that reason, it'd be difficult to take advantage of this minus thing here in this assumption. So typically, we just ignore it. But if the B is there and it's positive, then you can take advantage of this. So you really need that uh, correlation and uh, which will introduce uh, positivity. But of course, this is very specific. This, this inequality, unlike the... So this inequality is very specific to uh, the Barina algorithm. Because Marina works by compress, compress, compressing gradient differences. That's why gradient differences appear. For a different method, one would have to invent a different type of inequality. Okay, so. There is a question from Ilias. Okay, very good. Yeah. Hello, Peter. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah, I just uh, was wondering if there is some meaningful example where for holds but two doesn't uh mm -hmm. four holds but two two doesn't yeah so like because it, it doesn't two, it, so that the doesn't uh okay 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 four holes but two doesn't uh Uh, okay, so, so if all of these functions are identical, let me see, uh, what happens then? Uh, right, so if all of these functions are identical, then four is just zero on the left-hand side right 
so as soon as they are differentiable, uh, left hand side will be just zero because this will be exactly equal to this. So only differentiability and the fact that the FIs are identical automatically means that this holds with L plus minus being zero, right? But that doesn't mean uh, that there is any kind of smoothness involved, right? So the gradient doesn't have to be Lipschitz or anything. All, all that you need is these to be identical. Mm -hmm. So that would be one possible answer. But, uh, but we're not doing this. We're not assuming that four holds and two doesn't. We're, we're actually assuming that uh, one holds. So, so the chain is, is all okay. And then this is not an additional assumption. We actually need some level of smoothness. Okay, but so in so, principle, may, yeah. it could be interesting in some setting where it we... could be. It could be interesting. So I'm not. So I'm not saying this is a bad question. But uh, so I gave you one example of when that could hold. But uh, we do work in the setting where, in fact, both L plus L minus and L plus minus are well defined. So, yes, in, in, so, so we assume one, and as as soon as soon as you assume one, two, three, and four hold because of this chain of implications. And we work with all of these three constants, the orange one, the green one, and the blue one. It appears in the analysis, all of them, mm -hmm. uh, not, not, not the allies, but these three constants appear there. And then somehow uh, something nice happens because they appear there. So one thing that I really want to stress is L plus minus is not only smaller than or equal to L plus, but it could be tiny. Even if L plus is like millions, L plus minus could be one. So L plus minus is much more related to the similarity. It's some kind of measure of similarity of the functions rather than whether they're well conditioned, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is really, really important because the improvement in the rate eventually will come from the fact that where Marina had dependence on L plus, we will be able to replace the dependence by dependence on L plus minus. Okay, that's roughly what will happen. And because we do it, because we do that, uh, and because L plus minus can be massively, massively smaller than L, L, L plus, we get massive improvement. But in the worst case, L plus minus might be very close to L plus, and then uh, we don't get much improvement, but we always get some improvement. Okay, that's really what's going to happen, that somehow uh that's what's that's 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 behind and and you need this correlation between the compressors something like the permutation so that would be one example if you use the permutation compressor then you can completely uh, remove l plus so l plus will just disappear from the complexity completely and it will be, it will be replaced by l plus minus in some sense okay so now I, I will skip the second order characterization of Hessian variance because it's not that important. Uh, and if somebody asks me at the end, I'm quite happy to, to show that, but that's really not adding much, uh, much uh, intuition. It only adds an explanation why we call this Hessian variance. And it's because uh, the variance of grain differences can also be interpreted as some sort of a variance of some average Hessians between X and Y. So that's roughly what's going on if the function happens to be twice continuously differential. So that's all I want to say about this. And now I want to jump straight away into the main theorem. So we have two theorems in the paper, one for general non-smooth uh, functions. So only assumptions or assumption one, of course, two lower boundedness always, but, uh, and for that, for that reason, we have nf inf, which is lower bound on f and uh, Li smoothness of Fi's. So since Fi is Li smooth, and because of this diagram, we know that uh, uh, L plus constant is well defined, L minus constant is well defined, and L plus minus constant is well defined. And because of that, in the, the theorem, we have all of these three constants. Okay, L minus, L plus, L plus minus. And notice what happens here uh, in the in the rate. But first, first of all, let me just explain what this rate means. So we wanted to achieve this. So this was our goal. We want to find an epsilon stationary point in expectation. We're outputting actually a random iterate between zero and T minus one. So that's what this X hat T means. We're not outputting the last iterate. So it's a random point because we are putting random iterate and because we use random compressors. So for two random reasons, this is a random point. 
So, and how many iterations we need for, to, to achieve this? Constant divided by epsilon. And the constant is product of two constants, twice the functional suboptimality times this big thing in these parentheses. So let's just focus on this big thing in these parentheses because this is all standard. Uh, you can see the probability P with which we compute the full gradient that appears there. Let's not focus on it for the moment. Let's just focus on this part. So notice how L plus, L plus minus, and A and B that come from the ABN quality interact. And notice that normally for independent compressors, B is just zero. Okay, so this is just not there at all. B is zero. So what you would get there is just A times L plus squared. Uh, so you have dependence on this possibly huge quantity L plus. And all of the dependence is there. But by minimizing A and maximizing B, you can actually achieve A is equal to B. And the permutation compressor just uh, for that A is equal to B is equal to one, if N is equal to B, right? So permutation compressor or any input variance compressor exactly means that A is equal to B, which means dependence on this huge quantity L plus or potentially huge completely disappears. And all of the weight is put into this B and L plus minus. So somehow we replace this completely by this. But L plus minus can be massively, massively smaller than L plus. And that's where the improvement is coming from. Now imagine that on top of this, let's say we use input variance compressor, which means this thing is gone. And let's assume that we're also lucky that we're in the regime of very low Hessian variance. So some sort of similarity regime. And let's be super lucky. So the L plus minus actually is zero, okay, let's say. Of course, there's an extreme scenario, but just to understand what we would get in that case. Well, in that case, this blue thing is zero. This thing is zero. So this whole thing in the square root is zero. So the square root is completely gone. So if the square root is gone, the rate that we get is just L minus, which is the Lipschitz constant of the gradient of F times something divided by epsilon, which is exactly the rate iteration complexity of gradient descent in the smooth non-convex setting. But this method, uses uh, a permutation compressor, which means if n is equal to d, let's say, which means it only sends one float per client. So this is a d times improvement in communication complexity over gradient descent. It has the same number of communication runs, but each communication is fully sparse. Only one float is sent instead of d floats. So that's really the meaning of this theorem. So now I'll stop here in case uh, there are any questions. I'll just wait for one and then I'll keep going uh, until Samuel tells me it's over and then I stop. So I'll ask a question. Then. So do you think this is kind of the best we can hope for? So is this kind of lower bound also with respect to compression to so the best, best rate that we can hope for? Or you see there might be some improvements still? So. Uh, with we respect to compression. We don't, we don't have a lower bound. So we don't mm -hmm. know from perspective. Now, uh, no, I don't think, um, okay, so first thing that I want to say is that uh, we, we improve upon Marina in the case when this L plus minus is really smaller than L plus, because if it's not, then uh, changing weight from L plus to L plus minus is not really helpful. So, so it's not that in the worst case, always we improve. It's, it's something like there is a very 
uh, in the regime where a plus minus is really massively better, then we can get massive improvement. So it's something like in some specific regime we could we could improve, but it's not kind of in all regimes. Uh, we always have a very strict and uh, strong improvement. So of course we always this, this the rate that we get is always not worse than Marina rate, but in the worst case L plus minus uh, maybe is L plus and then uh, not much happens. Um, Maybe there are some other regimes in which uh, you could improve this further. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that this is the last thing one can say about these types of, uh, these types of uh, methods. But it'd be very interesting to develop a lower point. Okay, so thanks for the question and I'll continue. Uh, so let's look at this uh, critical term here just to quantify how much better one can one, one, one can one can get with this approach? So uh, so as I said, these variance input variance compressors they remove dependence on this bad guy L plus, and if L plus minus is small, one gets further boost. And in particular, what you could do is uh, if you if you use the original approach of Marina, Gorbunov and Carter's, where they use the let's say random one compressor. A, B constants are like this for random one compressor. And this red quantity, which drives the convergence rate just happens to be this. In our case with the permutation one compressor, A and B are one. And, it's, and this red quantity just happens to be L plus minus and that even could be zero, even if L plus is huge. So what does this, what does this really mean quantitatively? So it means, and uh, it means, so let's not pay attention to this table too much, but let's pay attention to the interpretation of this table. So if D is at least N, in which case we use one type of permutation compressor, we can get square root of N improvement. And N could be huge. So remember N could be thousands of devices and D could be, let's say 10,000s of parameters, let's say. And we can still get square root of thousand in case of thousand devices improvement. And this improvement, this ideal improvement is in the very low Hessian variance regime. If the Hessian variance is not very low, then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but there's always an improvement. And if it reaches, if Hessian variance just reaches this L plus, then we kind of get either minimal or, or no improvement. On the other hand, if you have many more clients than the number of parameters, uh, so let's say something like cross device setting where N is really, really large, um, then, uh, then you get one plus D over square root of N improvement. And this could also be huge because D could be much, much larger than square root of N. And this, this could be, this is not improvement of the type of 1% or 2%. This could be, you know, orders of magnitude depending on the relationship between D and uh, N. So, so this is the best case improvement which uh, we obtain in the very low Hessian variance regime. All right, so that's all about the theory. So we do have also theorem in the polyak loashevich regime where we have a linear rate and similar types of improvements, but I'm not going to talk about it. If you're interested enough, you can find this in the paper. So now I just want to highlight some experiments to show that uh, the, the improvement is not theoretical only, but in fact, it shows in uh, experiments as well. So the first experiment would be uh, a scientific experiment. So not an experiment with some real data people care about, but uh, experiment of the type that you always want to do when you design a new algorithm and you have a theory for it. You want to see, is the theory predictive? Can you actually see the theory translating into practice? And then you're quite willing to do some synthetic experiments when you let's say control for Hessian variance so that you kind of check whether the uh, improvement is larger when Hessian variance is smaller and uh, smaller when Hessian variance is larger. So, so that's exactly why you need these kinds of synthetic control experiments. So here we choose thousand clients, thousand features for simplicity, because then we can use just a simple permutation uh, compressor that I explained before. And we work with uh, non-convex quadratics. Uh, in this case, the average of these Hessians actually we assume it's uh, positive definite, but the individual AIs, they don't necessarily have to be. All right, so uh, because uh, Hessian variance is a property of these Hessians only, in fact, you just take the variance of these Hessians and compute the largest eigenvalue, and that's the Hessian variance L plus minus squared. 
So by designing AIs in a smart way, we can control for Hessian variance. So in the zero Hessian variance setting, L plus minus zero, so you can think of this as homogeneous data regime if you wish, uh, we get this kind of a result. So we run the permutation compressor uh, on the X axis, on this uh, horizontal axis, what we see is the number of bits per client sent from client to the server times uh, 100 million. So this means 50 million bits, 100 million bits are sent in totality from one client uh, to, the, uh, to the orchestrating server. And we can see that the square norm of the gradient is pushed to roughly 10 to the power minus uh, eight by Marina with the permutation compressor. And it's, 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 it's a much faster than uh, let's say random K. And the difference is roughly one or two orders of magnitude, depending at which time spot you look at, uh, at this. Uh, actually, it's two degrees of magnitude, no, one degree of magnitude uh, against the, the, the red one. And against the top K, uh, the difference uh, eventually would be even larger in this case. So, but for top K, we need to use a different method. We need to use error feedback. Otherwise, uh, this thing would not work. So Marina doesn't work with biased compressors such as, such as top K. So we use the state of the art error feedback uh, method EF21. So this is what we get here when we control for Hessian variance. Uh, and uh, the, the plot that I showed is this one, which is highlighted here. And we did experiments with larger and larger Hessian variance. So now it's 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and Hessian variance grows. And as you go from left to right, you would see that the advantage of using the permutation compressor slowly shrinks. And eventually you only have maybe tiny advantage or it's very similar to using top K. It's essentially always better than the random K, not essentially, but always. Uh, so uh, correlating these uh, sparsifiers is always good, but top K, eventually uh, catches up and, and is either very similar or, 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 or a little bit worse or a little bit better. On the, uh, but what has to be stressed is that uh, top K does not have any good theory. So the best known theory for top K that is known in this EF21 paper actually says that the method has a communication complexity of gradient descent. But uh, the best known theory for random K is that uh, the communication complexity is much better than gradient descent, and the perm k could be even much better if Hessian variance is small. So there is some disconnect here between theory and practice. So there's, there's a lot that we don't understand about top k still. So then we did some experiments on training auto encoders. So you have this uh, decoder encoder uh, mat matrices, and uh, and here are the dimensions and so on and so forth. Um, so this would be with the MNIST data set with 1,000 clients, and, and roughly we have 25,000 dimensions here. So this is over, over, over parameterized regime. So what we've done, we took all of these uh, um, uh, data uh, points, uh, and we partitioned into few partitions in order to uh, generate maybe homogeneous or more, or more heterogeneous heterogeneous data partitions, which intuitively would lead to uh, smaller or larger Hessian variance. So this is a homogeneous data partition. Uh, so it's random data partition. And in this case, you can see that the permutation compressor does much, much better than, uh, than uh, random K and uh, uh, a bit better than top K. And as you start going from homogeneous partition to more heterogeneous partition, what happens is that uh, top K catches up and for very heterogeneous data partition, top K is better than permutation K. But top K is used then with error feedback. And as I said, we still don't understand why top K does so well. There's no theory which supports this. Uh, as I said, as heterogeneity increases, permutation K does worse, but this is exactly what the theory predicts. So, so we're happy with this result, even though top K eventually overtakes random K. This is it, thank you very much. And uh, I'm quite happy to engage with any questions if you have any. Thank you, Peter. So if you have any questions, please feel free.
just to pause your question and just raise your hand. Okay, maybe I would start with one question. So because of the, uh, the quite good performance of top K, so did you also think about the like the following method that would be kind of a perm permutation K with combination of a top K that you would have, like you select the device, then the device kind of yeah, returns the highest, well, you could, think of, you could think yeah. of permutation K as some sort of non-greedy top K, if, if, you, if, if you wish, or permutation one as non-greedy top one. And this is how you can think of it. So uh, a random machine, so, so let's say you, you have D is equal to N, as many clients as uh, primers. And let's say you order the machines in order of a random permutation, okay? Okay, you order them in order of random permutation. And in this new order, the first machine will do top one. Exactly that. what the I second machine, thought. but the second machine will do top two. But I don't mean top two, both of the two, just the second, the second top. So it's not top two, but it's top two, two. You know what I mean? So it will not choose the top first, but the top second element. The third machine yes. does the top third element and so on. So by agreeing in this way, this is the same thing as perm one, as permutation one, but you can see that the, the first the machine in the permutation did top one, but then it'd be too greedy for the second machine to also do top one, and uh, because then uh, bad things can potentially happen. And, uh, and in fact, if you had the homogeneous uh, regime, bad things would indeed happen. So top one has this problem that if it works with homogeneous data, it will not benefit from uh, more clients. The performance will be identical uh, independent of the number of clients, but the performance of uh, Marina with PermK would improve. Uh, so, uh, so, okay, so that's one possible answer to your question that permutation one is a version of non-greedy, smarter top one, but there could be other combinations and uh, at least one of them I know that Laurent has been thinking about. Uh, so there's definitely uh, space for further research in, in this direction. I was thinking about like yeah, with each device kind of like if you have an order and if you know which coordinates were already communicated, so you kind of communicate the top one that was not yet communicated. I mean, in that sense, like you still have this property of uh, permutation that if you have n is equal to d, everybody communicates. Just uh, the difference is that maybe some of them communicate more important features. Or yeah, so there's a question by Grisha. I'm just unmuting. Uh, Hi, Bicha. Hi, Grisha. Uh, can you please comment uh, privacy issues with this approach of cooperated compressors? I mean, if we know what. Okay. 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 So, so I didn't say how to actually implement this coordination, and I don't have a slide on it. Uh, but let me let me just go here to the slide where I just had this three-dimensional example. Okay. So okay. So here. Uh, so how can you, can can you decide on maybe this is not what you ask, but you tell me what this will be asked because I can see two different interpretations what you ask. So uh, so how can we actually do this uh, in a communication efficient way? So you could just uh, so the, the the server could just tell each machine it could send it one number, which uh, is the index of the permutation they should be using. The, the, the index of the of the entry they should be sending in the next iteration. So this is very, very cheap uh, to perform because I just send one to this guy, three to this guy, two to this guy, and then everybody knows what to send. 
So you need some communication. So this is the level of coordination that is needed. Just the server sends uh, one index, essentially log D kind of uh, uh, amount of information to each uh, device to tell them what to send. Now, okay, so that's one possible answer that this can be implemented uh, without much communication. But maybe different uh, interpretation of your question was, are we revealing private information in any way? We don't have any uh, formal um, privacy guarantees here. But notice we're not actually sending the data, we're sending compressed gradient differences. And by compressing uh, gradient, difference, gradient information, you are, uh, you are um, adding some noise. So intuitively speaking, uh, uh, you are protecting without any formalism, uh, the gradients. Uh, but it'd be very interesting to see whether this compression on its own leads to any type of uh, differential privacy guarantees, which I don't know whether that is the case. I've seen some papers which even have it in the title that compression automatically leads to differential privacy guarantees, but these are very special compression mechanisms and not these generic permutation-based compression mechanisms. Did I answer your question? Uh, partially. So I meant the following issue. Uh, if we ask uh, some client to send a specific coordinate, that means that server uh, would know uh, what coordinate uh, of which client it has. Well, this same issue happens even if we don't ask because the server needs to know if you, if you apply random one sparsifier, when you send that float corresponding to that value, I don't know why I'm here actually, so I wanted to be somewhere else. Anyway, I'll just go to some random place. So if you send as a client something to the server, you need to say which element that was. Otherwise the server wouldn't be able to aggregate these gradients correctly. So I don't think that this permutation idea is adding any, diff any additional uh, difficulty into what already what, into the problems that already existed with random one compressor. So your, your question equally applies to just applying any sparsifier to any algorithm and we just inherit all those issues. But we don't create new ones. But might be the case that because for you uh, even when service is aggregated value it knows right. that I wish value from a certain uh, client. Well, this wouldn't be the case for random, because for random, that might be average of, of, of many, which many clients could pick the same one. No, no, because if, if, if a client sends to the server an entry, if you use a random sparsifier, right? Then, then the client has to say that I'm sending entry number five, and this is the entry. Yes, 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 but what okay. I meant is after aggregation, so after aggregation, if, if you if you see only aggregated value, oh, that already right. yes yeah okay okay fine so that that is correct. On the other hand, uh, in practice, d is not going to be equal to n, and then uh, every entry will typically come from more clients, especially in a setting where n is much bigger than d. So in a cross uh, device setting and in cross silo, maybe you don't care because, okay, because uh, maybe you introduce some other mechanisms there. I don't know, but I'm, I'm just dodging the question. I don't really know the answer, but, uh, but yes, these kinds of considerations certainly have to be made if one wants to prove any formal privacy guarantees, which we have, um, which we don't have at all. There's none. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know why I'm going here, but there is a question from yeah. Paul. Those reasons and this guy Paul. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I was wondering. Maybe I did not understand completely. Well, first, uh, thank you for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, uh, 
so you presented result, results on uh, the value of A and B for the permutation compressor. Right. And you say that you can have somehow A equal to B, if I understood correctly? That's, that's correct. Okay, and so does this hold for like any permutation or do you have to figure uh, some specific permutation that results in this A ah, 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 ah. So, so permutation compressor would mean that before each communication round, you need to permute. It has to happen iteratively in each communication round. So not at the beginning and once. So the permutation okay. happens repeatedly and it's always uh, a random permutation chosen uniformly at random. Okay. So, uh, so it's not any specific permutation, it's just a random permutation. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, if I go to this picture, then in one communication round, we choose permutation one, three, two, but in another one, maybe we choose two, three, one, and so on. So all of these, uh, you know, six different permutations, they will need to simply be chosen with equal probabilities. Does not uh, induce like a communication hub overhead. So it does. You... It, it it does. So because uh, if I'm going to use this permutation, I have to send to this machine information. Please use the first element yeah. now. But that it's is like, very very it's cheap. It's, it's a very very cheap. Right. Yeah, that is very cheap. So okay, okay. That's just that's even less than one float because all that I need to send is just the index of that element, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's that's very cheap. But, uh, but also maybe, maybe all of these clients can agree, especially in cross silo setting on some random seed which generates these permutations and then nobody has to be sending anything to anybody. Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. I cannot hear you anymore, but I'm assuming you oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you, you hear me now? Now I can hear you, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. I think I have this weird problem with the, my laptop mic as well. Uh, uh, and could you somehow take advantage of choosing like a good permutation that would end up in some reconstructed gradient that's more similar to the actual gradient or is it like- I, I don't know the answer to that question. I just don't know. So okay, okay. we had to use uniform permutations for, for the computation of these AB constants. Maybe if you assume something about the distribution of these VI vectors, so let's say that you train some type of neural networks and these VI vectors just happen to have some structure and they're not just arbitrary vectors. Yeah. Maybe then one can fine tune permutation and, 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 and have some kind of bias permutation bias to certain orderings, uh, which could lead to better result empirically. I don't know whether any theory could be, non-statistical theory could be, could be developed there. Okay, okay, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. For this Thank you. Precisions. Thank you, Paul.